Hello everyone and welcome to the latest Beatles News Brief Extra. I'm your host Steve Marinucci and this edition is dated December 6th, 2018. We have some chart notes from the latest issue of Billboard magazine dated December 8th. On the top album sales chart, the Beatles' White Album is number 10, up from 11. Abbey Road is number 42, down from number 36 the previous week. On the Catalog Albums chart, the White Album is number 6, down from number 3. And Abbey Road is number 23, down from number 11. On the Vinyl chart, Abbey Road is number 3, down from number 1. And the White Album is number 9, no change there from the previous week. On the Artist 100, the Beatles are number 37, up from number 40. And on the holiday charts, John, uh, Paul McCartney's Wonderful Christmas Time is number 15, up from number 23. And John Lennon's Happy Christmas is number 17, up from number 20. On the McCartney set list watch, number th- uh, November 30th in Copenhagen, the only change was the first song in the encore. Birthday was taken out, and I Saw Her Standing There was put in. December 3rd in Krakow, Poland, Junish Farm, and All My Lovin' were taken out in songs number 2 and 3, and Save Us and Can't Buy Me Love were added. That same set list was used for December 5th. The sound check for Krakow had uh, opened with an instrumental jam, then had Matchbox, Drive My Car, Flaming Pie, I Don't Know, S- San Francisco Bay Blues, Things We Said Today, Ram On, Midnight Special, and Lady Madonna. On December 1st, we talked to Jeremy Clyde of Chad and Jeremy. We saw him do an in-store appearance at Streetlight Records in San Jose, where he played from his um, Bottom Drawer Sessions albums. And we talked to him about that and about his shows with Peter Asher, which we saw the following night, and about his work and also acting on American television on the Dick Van Dyke show, Batman and the Patty Duke show. I gotta say the show which we saw at Bimbo's three sixty five Club in San Francisco was wonderful. It really was and we highly recommend it. The two men tell great stories all through the show, both of their own careers and also intertwined with the two of them with the two of them together. And it's a it's a delightful show. If you've seen Peter's show, you kind of know what to expect. But there are a lot of surprises now that the two shows are together, and we highly highly recommend recommend it. Um, in any event, um, we did a interview with Jeremy uh, in the uh, back of the record store, so you'll hear some music in the background, um, and. Like I said, Jeremy talks about uh, all sorts of subjects. One of the great things that happened that night uh, was that one of the fans that showed up was somebody that had taken pictures of Chad and Jeremy in the mid-60s, and she showed Jeremy the pictures, and he was just absolutely floored. uh, And it was really cool, and she was talking about how they how she encountered Chad and Jeremy then and how nice they were and it, it was it was really a cool moment that uh, to see it, this fan get back together with Jeremy in any event here's the interview and it's a delightful interview just uh, he's a, a very delightful person um, we hope you enjoy it I'm sitting here talking with Jeremy Clyde uh, Jeremy nice to meet you and nice to talk to you oh, thank you the feeling is mutual <laughs> <laughs> um you're you're out on the road. Uh, you're out with Peter Asher. That's right. Doing doing um, shows with him, and you're also what you were doing today was doing stuff from your uh, bottom drawer uh, sessions out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. T- tell me first about the bottom drawer sessions and how that's good. The bottom drawer started. sessions. Well, basically, um, I, I've got this all these songs up from the 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 archive goes from 1970 to 2015. And they're largely, I have so much material, uh, which Chad and I have I mean, in a la later incarnation, so uh, in the past few years before he retired, we managed to record a few, but there's so much. And the reason there's so much is because in, I was in a television studio in December 1979. I've been able to actually fix it. Um, and ran into the great jazz singer, Annie Ross, Lambert Hendrickson Ross, you know, wonderful stuff, uh, who I knew anyway. 
And she said, oh, you must come, I'm giving a party, a Christmas party, you must come. So uh, myself and the lady wife, uh, she then was, got ourselves togged up and off we went. And um, there I met an enormously tall fellow. Um, I thought he was American, he was in fact Canadian. Uh, and I said, what do you do? And he said, I'm a lyricist. And it was like a, a, a big light went on because his name was David Pierce, Big Dave, Big Dave as he was known on the scene. Turned out he had worked with other people I knew and we knew he was in the same circle. We just never met um, on the scene in London, as they'd say. But I was then, I dried up my songwriting. I was bringing up young children uh, it was, you know, all that the the enemy of promise, as somebody would say. Were you say. still? You were you and Chad were still working? No, 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 no. This is this is at the end of the sixties. Uh, we had put out two albums uh, for Columbia, right. which sold virtually nothing. And now these amazing cult albums that all these young people are picking up on. That was of Cabbages and Kings, and the last one was called The Ark. Mm -hmm. And uh, Columbia couldn't wait to get rid of us. And I was very aware, I mean, I'd already done three years of drama school, a year of repertory theatre. I mean, I, I was intending to be an actor. Things had sort of got sidetracked when John Barry, the late great film composer, had come down to a club where Chad and I were playing on a lunchtime gig and assigned us and suddenly we were a part of something that's now known as the British Invasion so it was all a big sideways step also I was homesick for England I mean I was living in California and I love California but I you know I'm, I have roots and um, I <clears throat> wanted to go back and wanted to go back and thought well I'm about to be 30 uh, this you know this, this music thing this pop business is short term you know, I think we've had it. I can see the downward slope. Time to get off. Um, and went back to England, so we, we broke up. Chad wanted to do film scores. He had other plans uh, for, of his own. He wanted to produce, and he wanted to do film music. So it was, okay, right, well, that's what we'll do then. And um, I was very lucky. I walked straight into um, big stuff. Um, you know, so in my career, it was almost as if I needed to have been away. And I was playing... 19, uh, and I was in fact 29. So it was, it was almost as if I'd managed to get a whole career in without, um, uh, and, and sort of without anybody knowing. In fact, I didn't even, I joined uh, the uh, uh, Sir Laurence Olivier's Shakespeare Royal, uh, the, the company at the Old Vic. And I, I was going to say, I know you did a lot of acting. Yeah, and, and I, ref, I, 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 I wouldn't admit that I had any pop background because in those days now it's still different you can do anything you, everyone everyone's everything any now you had to be serious in this pop business I, I hope you're going to be a classical actor go, oh yes of course so um, that was that so I that's when and so in 1979 nine years had gone by okay and I was wanting to write I had all the music coming through I tried with a couple of friends of mine who wrote uh, poetry and things. And then when I met David, Big Dave Pierce, I recognised that I'd found something absolutely exceptional. And we put in 35 years of work, and we worked as the winds blew us, really. Um, London, Los Angeles, and mostly in Paris, which is where he ended up living. And I was doing a lot of work in Europe at the time as an actor. And um, so... You know, he died in January 2016. Uh, I w wanted, you know, what's going to happen to all this stuff? So it was the question of settling down. And, you know, most people think, well, I, I'll try and make an album, maybe two. But to sit down and say, I'm going to make seven albums, quite possibly eight, is quite a sort of undertaking. It's sort of mad. Right. Uh, but we're, we're, it's doing, it's working. And now what is so wonderful is people are beginning to pick up on these. And, they, and the other thing is that they're not, they're not new songs. They are, I mean, Ray Davis and uh, McCartney and all kinds of people say, and now I'm going to put, sing a new song, and the room empties, <laughs> the arena empties, because, oh, God, it's a new song, boring. Uh, in this case, they aren't new songs. They're old songs. Um, and some of them are pretty all right. I, there is a, a move to put them out on uh, vinyl, 
because actually I think that's where they belong. Right. Because they are 20th century songs, and I'd love them to be on that format. Is but that, again, is that going to happen? Yes, I, I think so. Uh, it's money. I mean, you know, settle down. Okay, first of all, you've got to fund seven albums. Now you've got to fund a complete repackage. Uh, you know, and who knows whether they'll get bought. I mean, you know, this is these things are labors of love, and we, we, we approach them slowly and carefully and try not to go bankrupt. You're up to, you're up to number, f- you've, you've got four. Four out. I'm going back to London in a minute to uh, finish up number five or continue working When do you see that. the other two coming out beyond that? Uh, one a year. One a year. Is the, is the answer. Wow. So, actually, if you want to get, I mean, this sounds really weird, but by the time I'm 80... I think they will all be out. Okay. <laughs> That's the idea, is to get them done before the big 8-0. Let me backtrack a little yeah. bit and talk about John and Jeremy. You guys met when? Can we met in September 1960 in, at the Central School of Speech and Drama. I'd been there for a year, and people knew I played a few chords, sort of folky stuff, stuff and wouldn't put a guitar down, basically. Uh, and somebody came up to me and said, hey, you, 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 you're looking for another musician. I said, yeah, absolutely. He said, well, there's this new guy. He's just arrived in the teacher training course. And do you remember the surfing hit Apache? Yes. Yeah, well, it was, it was, there was a Shadows version in, in uh, England. He can play Apache the whole way through. I've heard him. I said, God, take me to this musical genius. He then turned out not only to be able to play Apache the whole way through on guitar, but he could then play... Um, oh, fantastic boogie piano and stuff. Hmm. And he was a chorist, he could sing, he understood harmonies. I'd been leader of the choir at school, so that was my, you know, I handled the solo stuff. And it was, you know, we both knew instantly that we'd, we'd found something great. There was a, a, um, a, a circular staircase at the back of the Central School of Speech and Drama. I imagine it's still there, like a service. Step, you know, so it's a lot of concrete. Right. And if you stand at the bottom there or sit down at the bottom there and sing in harmony and play guitars, it was just fantastic. So we spent a lot of time that, on the back stairs uh, singing away and had a terrible band called The Jerks uh, backing a guy who wanted to be Ricky Nelson but wasn't going to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was, uh, it was, it was great. And, and you know, we became absolutely best pals too. And it was, you know, the extraordinary thing is, looking back, is that one was in the right place at the right time. I mean, so much of life is about timing. Right. And uh, we didn't know that we were, uh, the, you know, uh, the, exactly the right place for the, uh, the music revolution in the 60s and swinging London and all that. I, uh, you're, you're, I mentioned you're, you're working with Peter Asher now, and I asked mm. Peter... At one time, I said, "What was the British invasion like?" And and actually, downstairs where you were talking, where you're seeing those pictures, it kind of you know, it was it was crazy, was it not? It was crazy and it was scary. I mean, people don't talk about that. It's it must be wonderful to be screamed at by lots of young women. Yes, it is. It's a young man's dream. Let me tell you. Um, uh, but it was also very frightening because there was a picture from the. Uh, book we were looking at downstairs which a f- lady fan had kept for years and years and years fantastic. extraordinary are pictures you, are you guys are going to do something with those is that right oh god yes oh, oh yeah. fantastic oh, yeah. and we um, there was one of us trying to get off a stage or onto a stage don't know really and you can see the hands are all reaching out and we're ducking like this trying to hold there was it was scary there was a moment we did a it was one of those little theatres in the round where you come through a sort of tunnel, like into an arena, and Chad is ahead of me, I'm behind him, and a girl literally jumped from up there, the top, oh and landed on Chad. Chad was furious, it, not about him, but about his guitar. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it was, I mean, we, I've had the experience of sitting in a limousine, not being able to go uh, forwards or backwards, and the roof is beginning to buckle because there are so many mm. uh, young women on the top. I mean, it, and it's a very scary situation. And they would tear at you, tear bits of your hair out, your clothing, uh, scratched, you know. It wasn't pleasant, a lot of it. You also, um, you guys both 
made appearances on three very well-known TV yeah. shows. Yes. Dick Van Dyke, Batman, and, and Patty Duke. Yeah. Um, I don't want to... I, I could get you talking about those for a long time, but just talk a little bit about each one. I mean... Okay, the first, and quite possibly the best, uh, was the Dick Van Dyke show. And they were so nice to us. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, we were straight out of drama school, and there we are with the gods of comedy. I mean, there's Carl Reiner and people. And there's... Um, they, they do these things... Uh, there's a sort of moment where you sit around... The first day, you sit around a table, and people bat ideas about... And we have read-throughs and then another read-through and so on. And then, a re- then the writers go away and fr- frantically rewrite. Then you come back the next day and you start putting it up on its feet. And, I mean, this is familiar stuff as far as I was concerned. This mm-hmm. is what you know, I've been doing. Um, and everybody was trying out things. Uh, you think it's really funny if I came in a little later? Yeah, okay, can, I go, can I do that from behind the sofa? Yeah, okay, mm-hmm. all that. And, um, which was, you know, familiar to me. And... And everyone was coming up with jokes and things, and I came up with this ridiculous gag. Um, and the gag is, which and, and Dick said, "Oh, that's great, that's great. We're going to keep it in. We're going to keep it in." And the gag, you'll forgive me for this. It was, I come in, we come in, we're playing Fred and Ernie, the Redcoats, mm-hmm. and I say, "Oh, this is nice." Uh, do you know, and I point at a piece of furniture and I say, "Do you know what we call one of these in England?" See, you remember this. And, and Dick says, no, what? And I go, a chair. <laughs> and and uh, you said that you're laughing. I, I think it's the lamest joke. Anyway, but it got a huge whoop in the in the show. You can, you can see they, they kept the cameras running. I was right. going to point that joke out to you. Because that's the one, the one line. That's not, mine. not the only line, but I mean, that's one line that kind of... You, you know, you remember that one. So. Well, thank you. And I thought, <laughs> I, I thought it was... I, I thought it was kind of the lamest joke I'd ever come up with, you know. And I wasn't proud of this at all. And then one day, I mean, a few years ago, Chad and I were checking into an airport, and the guy looks at us, and he looks at the guitars, and he goes, a chair. <laughs> See? See? Okay. It lives. <laughs> it, it does live. It does live. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, Batman, you which, want to Well, about? let me just ask yeah. one more thing about Dick Van Dyke. Sure. I mean, obviously, Dick Van Dyke was, was you know, was legendary, but I'm wondering... Of maybe the other cast members, I was thinking about this because I was watching the show mm. um, the other day. Of the other cast members, which one sticks in your memory the most? Um, gosh, they were all. There isn't a most. I suppose I admired. I mean, they were all absolutely sweet to us. Mm-hmm. Um, made us feel at home. Um, had no side whatsoever. I suppose Dick. Because I admired his timing really? so much, and his physical. I mean, you know, I, you know, done my stuff at drama school, and, and I knew a thing, or I thought I knew a thing or two about comedy timing, and um, I just watched some of the things he did, and it was so brave and so clever. Um, yeah, I, I suppose I was I was utterly in awe of Good his dick. of his 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 physical control. He was he could. He could do things. I we kept, they asked us back. They said, "Do drop in any time." Mm. So we did, and it turned out to be he was doing a bit where he was playing. This is very complicated to explain, but he was playing a DJ who was. Uh, he had to be in a shop window and spinning records for hours upon end, and he was getting very tired. And he did a thing with a... So you have a turntable going around and a paper cup. And he was he would do a thing where the turntable would go around and he kept talking. And he would put the cup down or miss it. And sometimes it would go down and sometimes it wouldn't because it would be going around the thing. Now, that is incredibly... Without looking and talking at the same time. And that is incredibly hard to do. Try it because anyway, the paper cup will, will fall over. And it wasn't stuck because he picked it up and drank from it and put it down and it would disappear and he'd reach out for it and it wouldn't be there and then it would be. I mean, this is really, really hard to do. And I remember sitting there just watching him rehearse this and thinking, my God, that's clever. I mean, that is amazing. Yeah, anyway. How about Batman? Batman. Batman was fun. Batman was fun because we were Chad and Jeremy. 
there wasn't much so-called acting in it. <laughs> well, you lost, I mean, your, you lost your voices in that. Yes, well, that what happened was the plot, the dastardly plot, as they say, was that the Catwoman, the wonderful Julie Newmar, who I fancied from afar hugely, <laughs> by the way, with absolutely no success at all. Um, and, um, <coughs> and she... Um, would she? The plot, plot was she was going to steal our voices, put them in a box, and hold the British government to ransom. And the British government, by the way, refused to pay up. Um, and there was a wonderful line in it. Uh, the British ambassador uh, had a line, Chad and Jeremy, not a penny for those blighters. <laughs> I love that line. And, you know, and I say on stage sometimes, we're talking about this, that uh, not a lot of people can say this, but I can with truth. I'm here today with my voice restored to me solely because of the good work of Batman and Robin. <laughs> it's a huge, <laughs> huge round of applause, or it should do. Really? Um, they were great. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was extraordinary fun. He was very nice, um, Adam West. And actually, he ended up uh, living in the same place as Chad now lives, which is up in Idaho, in right. Sun Valley. And they run into each other from time to time, or ran into each other. He left us. Yeah, he just had to yes, he just left yeah. us. I think that's right. shame. Um, uh, uh, sort of, you know, over the fruit <laughs> display or something. Mm-hmm. Oh, hello, Adam. Hello, Chad. You know, they would do that. Um, he was very, very nice. He was lovely. I didn't bond. I'll be honest about this with Bert Ward, particularly, um, who I thought was one of the very few people who seemed standoffish and arrogant or something. I don't know. Anyway, there you are. How about Penny Do? Loved her. She was so nice. Was she? Sweet. Um, I can't remember much about the show. I mean, we show a clip and Peter and I have our uh, um, show together, which, as Peter likes to say, has got twice the hits and twice the stories, which is true. And we run clips from da- Batman and Dick Van Dyke and... Um, uh, Patty Duke. Um, uh, she was just lovely. Really, really nice. And it, what is extraordinary is I look back and now, you know, knowing a bit about acting and stuff, she, the pressure she was under, she was playing two parts. She, I don't know when this girl slept. I mean, because she was in every scene, so she had to learn everything, she had to play two different parts. I mean, there was no, you know, when was she not on? Right. And she completely seemed to be doing it uh, like water off a duck's back. But I suspect it, um, you know... Um, Let me ask one more question. Yeah, sure. Uh, about the, the show with Peter Asher, uh, just, you, you just talked about that. You're, basic, you're basically talking about your whole career and, and showing clips. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, the point is, Peter and I are old friends anyway. Uh, we met, we think, in 63, we're pretty sure, and we're pretty sure we met in a place called the Pickwick Club. Mm-hmm. Uh, and actually, we had got. We had, there was a point where we were signed by John Barry, and we had a little lunchtime gig in a place called Tina's Bar, and we wanted to. Well, we, we were we, we were going after fame and fortune. We didn't need this anymore. And they said to us, you know, it's a shame because it was going really well. We were selling a lot of drinks. There was a buzz and everything, and that's what why John Barry had come down in the first place. And do you know anybody else who does this kind of thing? I said, sure, you know, Peter Asher, my friend, he's over at the Pickwick with his pal Gordon Waller. I'll ask them. And, and so we gave them a, a, a gig, and they were very pleased to get it. Um, and then within a year, we were all in the charts, and nobody could work out who which was which. It was extraordinary. That was pretty extraordinary. One last really quick yeah. question. You ended up covering a Lennon and McCartney song. How did that... How did that you remember From that? a window, I think. Is right. that what you mean? Right. Uh, well, it, yeah, Lennon McCartney song, but it wasn't done by the Beatles, so... Right. I don't know. There was the pressure we were under. Chad wrote, Yesterday's Gone, Chad wrote, completed uh, Summer Song, a uh, Summer Song, and then he sort of basically dried up. Uh, Chad, as a person, if you look at his career, he, he would write, every ten years, he'd write the single best song you've ever heard in your entire life, and that would be it. So he's got about... I don't know, half a dozen absolutely brilliant songs, but he wrote very slowly. I mean, one of the things about meeting David Pierce, Big Dave Pierce, was the fact that, you know, I didn't have to worry about what to write about anymore. And the floodgates just opened, the music came streaming through. Um, 
How, so, how does the how the the Lennon McCartney song come in? The Lennon McCartney song. Well, we were under pressure to to find material. You had to do two albums a year, three singles or something, and you know, and work twenty four hours a day, every day of the week, and get on airplanes and then now and end up in America. So the answer was, it came up. Yeah, okay, that'll do. We'll do it. There's an awful lot of stuff on those early albums which are just sort of fillers, to be honest. Just a contract to fulfil the, the terms of the contract. Okay. Thank you very no, much. My you. pleasure. My Thank pleasure. You. Right, we're off. We're out of here. Thank you again to Jeremy Clyde for the doing the interview. Uh, it was great to talk to him. Uh, and I just want to say that um, his Bottom Door Sessions albums, we've linked them through our That's What I Want Beatles Store page on Facebook. They are very delightful. They are they are a lot of a lot of fun. They're Jeremy uh, by himself um, with some instrumentation, um, but basically by himself singing some great songs, and I really want to recommend those to you also. You can get them through the links on our That's What I Want Beatles Store page. Jeremy Clyde won't be touring with Peter Asher again until after the first of the year, but if you want to see him before that, he'll be playing a December 12th at Flynn's Cabaret and Steakhouse in Felton, California, and December 13th at the Palms in Winters, California. Another piece of Paul McCartney news, Paul McCartney added four stadium shows in the U.S. The four new shows are June 8th at, in Green Bay, Wisconsin at Lambeau Field, June 14th at Arlington, Texas in Globe Life Park, June 22nd in San Diego at Petco Park, and July 13th in Los Angeles at Dodger Stadium. The pre-sales for American Express card members in Green Bay begins at 10 a.m. December 5th and runs through December 9th, and in Arlington beginning December 10th at 10 a.m. through uh, 10 p.m. December 12th. That's Wednesday. On this day in history, on December 6th, 1961, um, John, Paul, George, and Pete Best met with Brian Epstein to discuss his proposal to manage them. On December 6, 1988, traveling Wilbury Roy Orbison died of a heart attack at age 52. On December 7, 1957, George Harrison reportedly saw the Quarrymen perform for the first time. On December 7, 1963, the Beatles' second album with, with the Beatles began on 21 week run at number one on the UK album charts, replacing the previous number one, which was their own Please Please Me album. The Beatles also on that day appeared on BBC TV's Jukebox Jury. On December 7th, 1967, the Beatles' Apple Boutique on Baker Street opened its doors but lasted only seven months and closed by giving everything away, first to friends and then the public. And on December 7, 1968, the White Album began a seven-week run at number one on the UK chart. Um, you can catch our shows back-to-back on fab4radio.com or separately on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to join our Beatles News and Information group on Facebook for the latest in the Beatles world. And check out our That's What I Want Beatles store page on Facebook for gift ideas for yourself or for your favorite people. Till next time, this is Steve Marinucci saying... Be seeing you. that one market fab